And interestingly enough, we're finding that they were no different from us. We are no different from them. The same kinds of issues that they dealt with as human beings who were trying to be followers of Christ, we find rising to the surface then as they do now. And today is another issue that the early church struggled with that indeed we struggle with today. Reading from 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 19. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you were made your, when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who, while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and might forever. Amen. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. This is the word of God for us today. Thanks. Be to God. Money. We preachers talk out of both sides of our mouths when we talk about money. I is one, so I think I can say this. On the one hand, we preach constantly, don't be materialistic. Be careful, be careful of money, be careful, it'll kill you. But on the other hand, we seemingly are always saying, please give more, please give more, please give more so we can do what we want to do. No wonder we're confusing and confused about money. But I have to admit, the New Testament seems at times to also give us both sides of that coin. It features several texts that speak of caution when it comes to money. The stories that are shared display people who rely on their material prosperity for their identity, for their worth as a human being, and they have little concern for God. But on the other hand, the New Testament also identifies people of means, wealthy people who were appreciated as benefactors. In Luke chapter 8, Luke identifies for us Joanna and Susanna and others who accompanied Jesus and his 12 disciples who provided for them out of their resources. Also Phoebe, who is mentioned in Romans chapter 16, is believed also to have been fairly wealthy and she shared from her resources with many, Paul says. So the New Testament itself continues to say it's it's both and be careful be careful but also there are those who 
have lots and lots of resources and use those wisely. So it is indeed a thin line that we walk as believers. The struggle continues with our own text. Let's go back and look at it a minute. It has been observed to date that no one has ever seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. You cannot take it with you. Only what is done for Christ, the words say, will last. Paul expressed the same sentiment in Timothy, and our, and our thing that we brought nothing into the world, and indeed we will take nothing with us. The love of money, it seems, is a root of all kinds of evil, and it was a problem for the early church, and it still is today. As we go back and read how the early church handed down its memories, they remembered how Jesus himself seemed preoccupied at times with economic matters. He loved to use in his stories and sayings references to money, to offerings, to treasures, to taxes, to wages, to debts, investments, and rewards. He used monetary language. And in his age and in the age of Paul, in an age that was marked by an inequitable distribution of wealth that is very similar to our own, Jesus knew that money mattered. He knew that money talk could be used to speak vividly of the clashing priorities of the kingdom of God and the culture in which we live. Now again... Nowhere in Scripture does it say that money or worldly things are terrible things in and of themselves. They are inert. They are neutral. What Scripture does say over and over is that the making of, making of money our central trust or our central focus in life leads to disaster. Many of you will have heard this past week, a week or so, the story of what is happening with Volkswagen, particularly here in Tennessee because we have that deal, and how Volkswagen evidently literally just went in and changed settings. They did something illegal to pass certain tests. I was listening on one radio report, and they were interviewing a gentleman in Germany. I'm not sure if he was a Volkswagen employee, but he was from Germany. And here were the words that he said as they were talking about it. And he said, well, everyone, everybody does this kind of thing. And not just in Germany. It's worldwide. It's about the money. And I have been recently have been paying enormous attention. And maybe a prime example of how devastating this drive for those who want to be rich is the ruin that gambling seems to be playing in our culture now. Used to be you had to go to the casinos. Now all you have to do is pull out your phone or go to the local market and buy the lottery ticket. Or for me, the one I've been paying attention to a lot is this sports gambling stuff. And how they challenge us men that we're smart enough. Have you seen those commercials? But surely you're better than average, they will say. So you, you, Travis, are going to win. <laughs> because you're smarter than the average guy. So go ahead and spend your All it takes is a dollar. You put in a dollar, you may win 50 or Jason, we were talking about this this week. And Jason says in fine print down at the bottom. Everybody, anybody read that, the fine print? Basic earnings, average earnings are $38. But notice they don't tell you what the average losses are. All we're saying is, is that this, our culture now has found so many ways for you to pursue the opportunity to be rich in an instant. You don't even have to work for it. You just punch a button and off you go. It is estimated now that 10 to 12 million Americans, and that's probably low, now have a gambling habit that is out of control, and the number is indeed growing daily. How many of you stand in line 
and watch people that you obviously can tell don't have a whole lot and they're spending enormous amounts of money on those lottery tickets and things. The love of money is the root of all kinds of difficulties and problems. The passage that we have read reminds disciples that a profession of faith in God is incompatible with making money your goal. We trust in God, we say, as long, it seems to me, as we have the money, the phrase is printed on in our hands. I trust in God as long as I've got it. But when I don't have it, I'm not so sure. The biblical record says to us that when money becomes the goal of our life, be careful. Be careful. So Paul gives an alternative to this wanting to be rich as a series of choices. He says to Timothy and to us, flee all of this. And that word flee means turn around and run just as fast as you can. There is the implication here that this is not something you want to mess with. Run, he says, run. But then he shifts from the negative to the positive. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Boy, we keep running over those words, don't we? They just keep popping up as the fruit of the Spirit. Fight for faith, he says. Take hold of the eternal life you have already confessed. Keep the commandments. Actively, daily pursue kingdom life is what Paul is saying. So it forced me to ask myself a question this week as I was reading. And I share this question for all of us. Have I expended as much energy and time that I have control over this week in becoming more righteous Godly, faithful, loving, and gentle as I have to increase my monetary holdings? Have I thought as much about my identity as a child of God as I have about the, the world's identity for me? And it is. Rachel nailed it pretty solidly. The more you have, the more important you are. That's what our culture says. Jesus says something entirely different. Are we pursuing? Are we turning and running from the desire to make money? And are we pursuing these kinds of things in the time that we have? And I understand you have to work. And that's not necessarily a choice in the hours that you do. And so if you count those as you, you work and you get paid, that's a good thing. So I understand that. But in the time that you have control over, are you in the Word? Are you praying? Are you thinking about how I can be more like Jesus? Or are you checking E-Trade? Have you got a computer set up connected to New York City and the Dow? I was listening one day, we were in youth meeting, this was years and years and years ago, and we were talking about money, and, and one young person said, well, yeah, I'm just real honest about it. He said, my grandfather has got me into trading, and we'll spend eight or nine hours a day on the weekend sitting in front of a computer, watching it go up and down and making trades. Wow. Whew. Remember, it was Jesus who said, you will have a master. It will either be God or it will be money, but you can't have both. That's how Jesus said that to us. So in our text, back to it, after reminding us that God is God in that little middle part there, not our money or our accumulations, the letter returns to the topic of wealth, but from a different angle. You see, there are some of us in our culture, working and doing a good job in our work is part of our Christian commitment. We are called to work and be good examples at our work. Work hard. It's just that our culture tends to reward monetarily some work more than others. It just does. 
Someone told me recently that if basically your work is about things, you're going to make a lot of money. But basically, if your work is face-to-face -face with people, you're probably not going to make a lot of money. That's okay. It doesn't matter what you're called to do. It's just that some cultures, some jobs in our culture, reward work monetarily more than others. That's just the way it is. But here, Paul says in this section, it deals with people who have indeed made good money at what they do. And so, as, a, as implicit in the earlier discussion, the problem lies not in the riches themselves. It's not the money that's the problem. It's what we're doing with it. And if people determine to accumulate wealth rather than to use it to alleviate others' needs, Paul says, now it has become difficult. Therefore, he says, those who have riches are to do good. To be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves, he says, treasures of a good foundation for the future. Remember, it was Jesus who said, for where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. He's telling us this fine line, be careful. You cannot serve both, but you will serve one, God or money. Check out where your heart is, and that'll tell you which one is your God. Remember also, remember also that it's hard for us not to compare to the person beside you. We live in America, and so certainly there are some here that make six and seven figure salaries. And some of us have to work two jobs just to barely make a living. And I don't, I'm not, I want to say I, poverty is no fun for anybody. But remember, that if you take a hundred people that represent the world, if you took a hundred people, the richest people would be us. When we were understand ourselves in the global market, we are filthy rich related to the rest of the world. So we have to always keep things in context. But in a culture that is indeed obsessed with money, the question becomes, what can we, what can I do to keep from crossing that line, to make sure that on that fine line, I'm always leaning towards God as my master, that I'm always fleeing those things and pursuing righteousness and goodness. How do I keep from crossing that with my resources and having them control my life. There are two things I think that Paul under quietly mentions here, but I'll mention both. Worship. In the book Praising and Knowing God, the, the author suggests that worship is becoming more difficult as resources in a particular congregation increase. The richer the church, the more difficult it is for worship to be authentic. Indeed, the more affluent, and less generous a congregation is, the more muted its congregations worship, as they will say. Which is one of the reasons why we talk about offering time as a real act of worship and an opportunity. It's not just to return a little. I loved what Stephen said in his prayer. God, help us to give generously. So often we talk about, God, we're going to bring just a little of what you've given to us. Isn't that an indictment on us? It's about a generous heart. And in worship, what we do together, we are reminded that God is God and nothing else. It is in worship that we pull ourselves away to hear again the word, to sing the songs of our faith, to pray, to be reminded who is my God in this coming week and who will it be. So make worship a priority for you. But that's what we do together. What can we do as an individual? A lost, lost commandment, actually. Sabbath practice. Read any, read any 
data you want to read. And we as a country are becoming more and more and more consumed by our activities. There is zero downtime anywhere now as a general rule. Sunday is no different now other than maybe what you do for a couple of hours on Sunday morning. But then Sunday noon to Sunday afternoon to Sunday evening pretty much is like any other day. Well, remember, Sabbath really is more about a way of living than a day. But it does say take a day, take a dime, a, a, a distinct time in your week to focus on God. Maybe that's why we have trouble pursuing righteousness and goodness and faithfulness and holiness. Because we never stop long enough to do it. Oswald Chambers says, The busyness of things obscures our concentration on God. Never let a hurried lifestyle disturb the relationship of abiding in God. It is a very easy thing to do. But we must guard against it. Maybe one reason that we struggle with focusing on God is we never stop because we're always focused on our other parts of our lives. Worship and Sabbath, Paul says, are two ways indeed to be careful. Our text today reminds us that we walk a fine, fine line between good, honest work and letting money become our God. And so I invite you once again to listen to this text. Listen and pay close attention again to the last phrases. We have brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and to many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, person of God, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God who gives life to everything and of Christ Jesus who, while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession, I charge you. To keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, here's the worship part. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and might and glory forever. Amen, Paul writes. But he comes back. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, So that they, and listen carefully, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. The word of God for us today. The only true life is life that is spent seeking God and God's ways. Whether your work rewards you richly or whether your work doesn't pay you what you're worth. Seek God. 
Do good with whatever you have. This is the word of God for us today. Father, we do come before you thanking you for the gifts you have given to us. We thank you for the material and monetary resources that have come our way. We thank you we live in a country that is able to pay such high, high salaries. We thank you for all of that because poverty is no fun for anybody. And you have words to say about that. But Father, help us, those who live in the wealthiest nation, remind us how difficult it might be for us to seek you first. Remind us that that fine line we are walking on, we may be stepping off of it. God, that in some parts of our life, money may have really become our focus. So convict us this morning as you have been convicting your followers since the beginning of the church. And help us this day to worship you, to seek you, and to follow you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We invite you today to respond to the gospel. The good news is that the life you or all of us are seeking is found in God. And maybe today that would be your response, that you've been seeking life in so many other ways. And today the good news is God has life for you. And today you would receive that. And you would come and say, I, I'm tired of trying to make life on my own terms. And I receive the life of God, which is forgiveness and grace and eternal life, but also life now. Follow God. Maybe that's your response, but maybe you've been following God, but today in the Word of God you have heard, ooh, wow, there might be some areas of my life that I need God to take hold of better, more fully. And that would be your prayer from your heart to His, but if I can pray with you about that, I would be honored. Maybe you just need to come and kneel and pray. Maybe there are some here been visiting with us for some time, and God is saying, plant your life here, make it permanent. Make a commitment by joining with this congregation as we move together to do the kingdom work in this place. Whatever your response, you make it to God from your heart to his. If I can help in any way, I will be here as we stand together and sing our hymn of response.